Just fine. How about you? Just yeah. great, thanks. Say, you know, it's been a long time since I've been by here. How long you had? No, oh, not too long. Just long enough. Oh, yeah? At the end of the 1960s, International Harvester had already had success with their 656 and 544 tractors, so they continued upon that with the 826 and the 1026. And both of those tractors, like the previous ones, were available with either a gear shift, uh, you know, a standard shift transmission, or the, the hydrostatic transmission that International Harvester had pioneered back in the 60s. And much like in 1950, when International came out with the white demonstrator tractors, in 1970 they came out with the gold demonstrator tractors. And the gold demonstrator tractors were just the regular production tractors with some gold paint on them. And it was kind of a celebration of their new, their 1026, 826, and a continuation of the 544 and 656 tractors. When winter gets tough and the snow gets deep, fight back with Scout. Scout lets you shift into four-wheel drive for extra traction. And now's the time to buy an International Harvester Scout for next winter. Special factory reductions to your dealer on 79 models make it possible for him to give you a better deal than ever. Next time winter looks like this, fight back with this. Scout, anything less is just a car. Now the early 1970s were a very good period for American agriculture. There was uh, an abundance of, of good crops, there was good money for the crops. The administrations in the White House, uh, they had advised for farmers to get big or get out and that was one of the slogans I think Nixon had coined. So a lot of the farmers went out and took out a lot of, a lot of debt. They bought more land, they bought newer equipment and they just kind of put themselves at a disadvantage later on in the 70s. But, but for the early 1970s, they were in pretty good shape. Uh, the commodities were good. There was demand for the products. Uh, International Harvester had a new person at the helm and his name was Brooks McCormick. And the last, the last McCormick was Fowler McCormick in the 1950s. So when Brooks McCormick took over, he already had uh, what they call the stodgy company. They, they had too many lines. They, had the truck, the industrial, they had the lawn and garden or the consumer products division, and of course they had the agricultural division. So what was what was looking like in the early 1970s was they had a lot of antiquated equipment. So John Deere had come out with their new generation and then their uh, Gen 2 tractors by the 1972. So McCormick, Brooks McCormick really encouraged uh, new design technology and so by the mid-1970s, International was retooling up for new tractors and they decided to sell the light truck division. So the age of the, you know, ton or less International Harvester trucks was essentially over. And they were in a, in a situation right about then where it could go either way. And, and for a couple years, it looked like they were going to shave off a lot of the debt. Uh, but then it, towards the end of the 70s, there was kind of a a chain of events that happened and one of them was they hired Archie McCardell who his, Archie McCardell on the surface looked like a pretty good guy he had some success with other companies and one of the things that Harvester had done was they gave him a loan of like 1.8 million dollars uh, worth of stocks and so that was going to be part of his bonus well as the, the 70s wore on 
the commodities started to pile up, the, the European customers, they, they were going through their own economic times, so they weren't buying combines, we weren't shipping corn out to Russia or Ukraine and all those other places as, as we had been earlier. So everything was kind of stagnated and equipment was starting to sit on the, on the shelves, so to speak, and so Harvester was given deep discounts on the equipment to get it out and they had good designs, they had good equipment. Uh, you know, the lawn and garden, the Cub Cadets were really a profitable entity that they had. They used Wisconsin steel to make a lot of their, their molds, or not their molds, but Wisconsin steel provided a lot of the raw metal to make harvested tractors. Well, Wisconsin steel was, was an old plant and they needed to retool up and the things being what they were, Wisconsin steel just padlocked the gates one day and so that left Harvester with a, with a huge hole that they hadn't planned on. Uh, the banks cleaned out Wisconsin Steel's accounts and then all the people, the checks bounced and, and it, was a real, it was a real debacle. And also right about then the UAW was going to strike. There was a whole bunch of, of different things. Now John Deere had mandatory overtime for years and International did not do that. Well International realized that in order to like keep up with Deere they needed to have mandatory overtimes. But the the employees didn't want anything to do with that and then coupled with Archie McCardell's 1.8 million dollar bonus that Harvester was going to forgive uh, you know they they were like it needs to start from the top down and so they they took quite a few months off before they came back to work and so that whole time Harvester was not building equipment and the inventory was sold out and dark times were upon us, so to speak. The new designer's name was Greg Montgomery, and he had at least 17 patents. He really was an admirer of Henry Dreyfus, who had been an earlier designer. Henry Dreyfus, if you remember, designed a lot of the John Deere tractors and styled them. He was also responsible for the new generation tractors, but one of the things about Henry Dreyfus was he made styling that was essentially called, you know, timeless. So Greg Montgomery wanted to copy upon that and he came out with the 50 series tractors which are the, the black stripe ones, the big red tractors with the black stripes and it's one of the, probably one of the better looking tractors that International had come out with and that of course is debatable but in modern times I think that it still holds true that the uh, 50 series tractors are timeless. The dealer. And I handle a wide variety of IH lawn equipment. With attachments that'll handle all your major yard jobs. Like this IH Cub Cadet. This one machine can handle mowing, rototilling, leaf sweeping, snow plowing, shredding and grinding, and a lot more. They'll last for years. And naturally, I give you parts and service, pickup and delivery, and advice on the best way to take care of your property. See what your IH dealer can do for you. The models of tractors, they, you know, they had the 88 series. The, the Cub in the 140 went away and were replaced with, with new tractors from Japan, which were, were pretty successful. They had Mazda gas engines and they had diesel engines made by Mitsubishi, but it wasn't enough. And so by the end of the 1980s, Harvester knew they had to come up with some, some cash. They had been downgraded as far as their credit rating and they, they were really cash strapped. So they unfortunately sold off one of their main entities that was generating cash flow, which was the Cub Cadet line. So pretty much anything under about 20 horsepower went away. The Teneco Cop Corporation had a lot of entities and oil was one of them. They also were the primary owner of, of Case Corporation, J.I. Case. And it, in the early 1980s, they realized the harvester knew that they, they could not sustain any longer. The banks wanted their money. They had renegotiated some loans a few times, but their credit rating was, was no good. The employees didn't want to work. And it, it wasn't the employees' fault. There was a lot of it had to do with the, the, uh, the unions. And of course, Archie McCardell had his, his $1.8 million. And it was too little too late. They came out with a lot of good tractors to be released in the, in the early 80s, like the 2 plus 2s and a bunch of other things. And Harvester got rid of McCardell. Uh, they knew that he was no good, so they got rid of him. But it was, it was too late. So Teneco bought International Harvester, and they, they did keep Burr Hill, Burr Ridge, uh, but they also were at a loss in the mid-1980s, so they ended up selling off most of the original McCormick farm. 
Later on in 1989, Tenneco sold off Case IH and it became Case New Holland. But when it was Case IH, the, the tractors that came out, they looked a lot like the, the existing IH tractors. They were red and the Case letters were big and the International was small, so it seemed to make everybody happy for a little while, but sales were abysmal. And that's pretty much where this video is going to end off. I'm going to start with the early 1970s and end up with 1985. And unfortunately, Harvester is gone, uh, but not forgotten. And there's a lot of us who still like these old tractors and we keep them running. And thankfully, there's still a good market for parts. And there's a pretty good following still for international harvesters. And it could be, you know, your dad had one or your grandfather or somebody you knew. Or maybe us older folks, you just grew up with IH on the farm. So I appreciate you watching this video. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, if you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe to the channel. And let's take a look at some of these pictures uh, from the, the 70s and 80s. International engine with its unmatchable lugging ability to pull you through the tough spots without shifting. A multi-range, high-torque diesel that enables you to get more work out of each gallon of fuel and each hour of time. An engine with unparalleled reliability that you can depend on season after season. Right size to fit my farm. And a real row cropper, too. You don't say. It's got on-the-go power shifting, torque amplifier transmission, a power shift independent PTO, and a three-point hitch with torsion bar load sensing. You name it, this 2 plus 2's got it. The 2 plus 2, huh? Say, I've been hearing quite a bit about this, but I don't quite get the drift. What is it, then? You get all the advantages of a two-wheel drive, all the row crop versatility and such, plus the advantages of two more full-time drive wheels up front, giving you all the efficiencies of a four-wheeler in traction and flotation. Well, then why not just call it a four-wheeler and be done with it? Now, let me show you. It doesn't have the typical limitations of a four-wheeler, especially when it comes to row cropping. Plus all the other kinds of general work that you normally do with a two-wheeler. Ah, oh, come on now, Doug. You make two plus two sound like more than four. I <laughs> get carried away. I noticed. <laughs> Be that as it may, this plus two gives you a lot more traction, a lot more stability, especially on uneven ground, a lot more flotation, and a lot less compaction. Plus handling on the rows that you wouldn't believe. Is that so? The rear wheels always track right where the front ones go, straight as a rifle barrel down the rows, never yaws one iota. Around the curves, too, the rear tires always follow in the tracks of the front ones. Now, that's hard to believe. And you know where you are on the rows all the time. Uh-huh. But the main thing that sets this 2 plus 2 apart, its main advantage over a typical four-wheeler for row crop work is that the control center is back here on the rear half. I can see that, so? So, where's your control center on a typical articulated four-wheeler? Well, it's pretty well up forward. Actually, you're riding on the front half, up with the engine and front axle. True. When you're row cropping, that's a tremendous drawback, right? Right. Sure, you lose your feel for what's going on back here where the work's being done. Hey, it's starting to make sense. You don't have nearly the row crop control you have on a two-wheeler. A good point. But on this one, you do, because on... Well, the... because you're controlling everything from the rear back for the hitch and implement on. Exactly, just like on a two-wheeler. Beautiful. I tell you, there's never been anything even remotely like this tractor. I love it. Hey, I kind of got that idea. <laughs> you got to drive it to believe it. Hey, how about letting me take it around a couple of times, huh? I'll hop right up. But there is one condition. Oh, yeah? What's that? That you don't blame me if you end up buying one. Oh? Once you drive this tractor, you're going to be unhappy with anything else. You're going to be unhappy every time you get up on that one you've got. You think so? <laughs> I know so. And you're going to blame me for being the one that spoiled it for you. Well, maybe, but I'd like to try it anyway, okay? Okay. You've been warned. Good advice. When you try one, you'd best be prepared.
fortunate to buy one. You hit the field with one of these new 88s, and you know for the first time the unbelievable experience of having full-time 2 plus 2 traction, pull power, stability, and flotation combined with true row crop versatility and control with either 130 or 150 PTO horsepower. These 2 plus 2s are designed especially for row cropping with rear-mounted implements. As the man said a moment ago, the control center is rear positioned where it needs to be to give you the proper feel and precise control of the implement that a two-wheeler gives you. The kind of feel and control that you can't get with a typical four-wheeler. You're in full command of the operation. A critical advantage when you're doing exacting work like planting, cultivating, bedding and such. The engine's located ahead of the front axle. This means you have adequate built-in weight for stability with rear-mounted implements. And there's no need for front-end weights, wheel weights, or calcium in the tires for most heavyweight tillage jobs. You get optimal flotation and traction with minimal compaction, wheel slippage, and fuel consumption. Optimal conversion of horsepower into work power. You get more work done per gallon of fuel. The optional night lighting system features highly functional light placement that's been researched and developed especially for row crop work. Powerful forward lighting is placed down close to the rows where you need it most. At the articulation point, you get a light on either side for optimal visibility during turns. And you get an abundance of lighting back where the work's being done. Adjustable halogen lights on the rear fenders can be aimed wherever you want a bright, clear view to the rear, sides, or front. An all-jobs tractor that's just the right size for handling the major workload on the average size farm. Another big advantage, you can step up from two-wheel drive to two-plus-two performance without having to buy bigger implements to enjoy its benefits. You can still use your existing tools efficiently and effectively. This is full-time two-plus-two drive. with 
an all-new quiet ride control center, big horsepower, and extended fuel capacity, new simplified serviceability, new wet brakes and differential lock, and numerous other new design features, completely redesigned to give you the tractors you asked for. One of the first things you notice, of course, is the all-new styling. Automotive styling, featuring curved shapes that give not only an all-around pleasant appearance, but more important, provide maximum strength. The operator's control center has been completely redesigned. The operator's been moved forward, a lot closer to the center of the tractor. This gives you a lot smoother ride. The closer to the center you sit, the less bounce and shake you get, especially from the rear axle. And it gives you a lot more upfront visibility and control. Plus, there's no muffler to obstruct your view. It's been relocated under the hood. The control center is designed, engineered, and built by International as an integral component of the tractor. The control center is an environmental pod, so to speak, that's been fully integrated with the ROPS, the protective safety frame, to give maximum rollover protection. There are two full-size doors for easy entry and exit. The seat's adjustable to fit virtually any size, shape, or posture of operator. The telescoping steering wheel can be adjusted to your preference. The pedals are suspended to minimize the transfer of noise and vibration through the firewall and also provide an uncluttered deck. They're hydraulically powered for reduced pedal effort. The control consoles have been redesigned and relocated to give completely uncluttered ease of operation. You can get a digital tachometer that displays ground speed, engine speed, engine hours, and two PTO speeds. For easy serviceability, all the instrumentation is modular plug-in design for quick disconnect. The air conditioner condenser is now up front. This reduces noise and makes it more efficient. A swing-out oil cooler makes for quick, easy checking and cleaning of cooler, condenser, and radiator. The coolant level is continuously monitored by an indicator that lights up if it gets too low. The batteries are sealed and maintenance free. You never have to add water to them. Engine modifications have been made which result in reduced noise and longer service life. You get higher torque with more deep down lugability, which international engines are famous for. You get more than ample power in every model. In the 1086, you get 130 PTO horsepower. The 986 delivers 105. The Hydro 186 gives you 104. The 886 with 85 horsepower. The 1486, 145. And at the top of the line, the 1586 delivers 160 horsepower. In each 86 model, you get an engine matched to the tractor size a multi-range engine designed for high-speed, hard-pull farming. An engine so durable, you can run it for thousands of hours without ever touching a wrench. We've also increased the fuel supply. Moving the control center forward allows us to put a bigger fuel tank at the rear, where it's easier to fill. For extended operation, an auxiliary tank will give a total fuel capacity of up to 85 gallons. This auxiliary tank is standard on the larger models. Both tanks are filled through the main tank, and the fuel gauge shows the combined volume of both. For quick, easy servicing, the hydraulic fluid dipstick and fill pipe are located outside the control center. In fact, all the hydraulics, except the optional hydraulic seat, are located outside the control center for both easy servicing and noise reduction. The hitch has been modified, so it can be adjusted easily for proper fit and for trailing implements. It has a positive easy store bracket for the upper link. There is also a third auxiliary valve available for handling more hydraulic operations. 
These new tractors also have the all-new differential lock and oil-cooled wet disc brakes, giving you the most reliable stopping action possible and many times longer life and an electronic brake wear indicator that lights when the brakes need servicing. These all-new Series 86 tractors are really loaded with desirable features, giving you improved serviceability all around. Big power for high-speed, hard-pull farming. Extended range in the field. All-new wet brakes and differential lock. An all-new control center designed as an integral component of the tractor. Better visibility. And a smooth, quiet, comfortable ride. Try these all-new 86s on for size. We know you'll like them. After all, they're the tractors you asked for. Power never came with so much comfort. It's like a compact, but it's roomy on the inside, so it's like a sedan, and it has a lot of space for a lot of things, so it's like a station wagon. A Scout is like a lot of cars, but it's definitely not a car. It's a, well, it's the International Scout.
Today's American public is becoming increasingly aware of the overall usefulness and practicality of every item they buy. Rising prices and tight money have forced most Americans to carefully evaluate their needs and spend their money in a way that will satisfy their overall needs. In the automotive market, the sharp increase in four-wheel drive vehicle sales is positive proof that the American public is recognizing the versatility and practicality of four-wheel drive vehicles. Today's comfortable, smooth-riding, but rugged four-wheel drive vehicles are a far cry from the rough-riding, stripped-down vehicles that were sold during the early post-war era. Their evolution to the comfortable, multi-purpose vehicles we know in the 70s has taken almost 25 years. This isn't just a car, it's a scout. Come on. Yeah. You traded our station wagon? Where do you try the four-wheel drive? <laughs> <laughs> try that in a car. Ooh. Oh, scout handles beautifully. And I can see over the cars. Honey, my new scout is more than a car. Your new scout? Scout. Anything less is just a car. See other models at your international scout dealer.
quite a handy light to have in the wilderness. It's the Coleman Electric Lantern. 400 of them will be given away free in the wilderness sweepstakes from international trucks. 100 lucky families will win four Coleman sleeping bags, and 50 first place winners get all these fine Coleman outing products. To get complete rules, simply register at participating international truck dealers across the country. There's nothing to buy, but you'll want to see the International Scout and the International Camper Pickup, the other pickup. And then there's the International Travel All. What makes it beautiful is what it does. See them all when you enter the Wilderness Sweepstakes at your nearest participating international truck dealer. It's your chance to win one of 550 great Coleman products worth over $60,000. Offer void where prohibited by law. Here are some tough reasons why a Cub Cadet is built to last. It starts with a farm tractor style transmission, powered directly by a twin cast iron cylinder engine, supported by a pivoting cast iron front axle. Add Cub Cadet's rugged durability, and you've got a garden tractor with raw power. In fact, the only thing is tough is a Cub Cadet. Is another Cub Cadet. Cub Cadet. Tough tractors for your little corner.